So, damn it, I've got my eye on you. Careful what you say, sir. Um, well, I'm going to mute everybody, and I'm just going to carry on talking because that's kind of my prerogative. Um, there we go. Um, and then I'm going to unmute Phil. There we go. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to our second Be a Better Marketer. Um, special thanks to those that have returned after the first one. Clearly, we, uh, we made a good first impression. Um, welcome in particular back to Phil Cave, uh, MD uh, of People Shaped Marketing, who is our resident marketing strategy and persona marketing expert. Um, today, Phil is going to be talking to us about more advanced um, concepts in marketing. We're going to be looking at um, the psychology of marketing, the psychology of your uh, marketing communications, and he's going to delve quite deep into the best and most effective way to write more comms. Um, so on that note, I'm going to hand over to the ever awesome uh, Phil Cave. I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to jump in occasionally if I get a chance. Can I ask? I've I've muted everybody by default. If we can keep it that way to avoid too much distraction during the conversation. If you have got any questions and you'd like to chip in, please pop them in the chat, um, which you should have accessible through the GoTo meetings. Um, and we will fire those at Phil. Either I know, I'll fire them, I'll, I'll unmute myself and fire them straight at him, or we'll um, hit him at the end of the session. So without further ado, over to the ever awesome Mr. Phil Cave. Uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for having me back again. It's uh, 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 an honour to be here. Okay, so uh, I want to dive straight in and um, build on what we, we covered last time, which I'm just going to do a very quick recap for, for people who, who, weren't, who may not have seen the first one, uh, um, just because we're going to be building on that, as I say, and actually delving a little bit deeper into how we can start to, to get those propositions together. So very quickly, what we covered, if you remember, was uh, the key to all marketing really is giving people what they actually want, because when the perfect offer is made, that's when people buy. Now, that sounds really, really obvious, and it should be, because marketing is actually quite simple in its, in its basic terms. So if you remember, we covered the before and after, and that was a, a big focus of the last session, where we have our unhappy chap in his before state. And happy chap in the after state. And all marketing really does is articulate the transformation from the before to the after. So what it does is we paint the picture of after you've bought our product or service, they go from unhappy to happy. Very simple stuff. And we introduced the before and after table, which is just quite a nice way of, of you know you guys being able to go back into your office and, and do it for yourselves. So it's literally just the two columns before, which is mainly pain points and after which is their aspirations and we break that down into four sections so what does the prospect have in the before state and in the after state how do they feel what is their average day look like what is their status and again all in the before and after state now if you remember we, we then did a, a quick example a couple of different uh, personas based on people who may want to be buying coolia and one of those was was our friend andy the gym owner and now we had all this information up up here and his main gripe was really that he's a startup gym and he doesn't have enough time or organization to be able to do sales properly and get enough paying members to make his, his business worthwhile. So what we did is we looked at Andy's before and after uh, tables and in his before state, he had a shortage of members, as we're very new and aren't established. And in his after state, after he bought Coolia, he would have lots of members and inquiries coming regularly. He feels frustrated and concerned, a little scared for his business. He feels happy and proud of my business and I feel like a success in his after state. His average day before, he never has enough hours to focus on sales like he needs to, he's losing money. In the after state, it's a structured sales approach, taking less time. More members equal more money, which means I can employ salespeople. His status, he feels like a busy newbie trying to make this work and afterwards like a successful business owner. Now, that's all very sort of simple stuff. And then we put together an elevator pitch specifically for Andy. So what we're saying is, you know how frustrating it is when you just can't focus on growing your sales as much as you need to. So delving right back into that before state problem. That's what I was like for years with my health spa. 
And that's when I started using Coolio. Now, my sales and marketing efforts are organized, personal, and take up less time with much more success. So introducing that after state. And with Coolio, you too will have a healthy membership and a successful business that you can be proud of. Now, the reason I wanted to, to, to quickly recap is because we had a lot of questions at the end saying that's, that's great, but how do we start to get that information about our customers? And the answer was twofold, really. One, and the best way is still to be able to run workshops with your customer facing staff. So if you have any salespeople out there or franchisees or anything like that, people who deal with customers on a day to day basis, let's get a few of them in the room and we can actually workshop through exactly what it feels like and what all of your different customer segments look like. The other way, of course, is to talk directly to your customers. If you have any that are friendly enough to, to want to be invited to marketing workshops, that'd be great. We can also run surveys and things like that to our customers and, and we get some information back, but you have to always take surveys with a pinch of salt because we all know people like to put in the information that they feel like they want to be the right answer as opposed to what they genuinely think. However, there's a third option, and today we're, I'm going to show you how we can sort of start to estimate around with about 85 to 90 percent accuracy without ever having to talk to any of the sales teams or any of the customers themselves. And it's a, a, a technique that I've used for many years, and I think well, I hope you're going to find it pretty interesting. So, how do we really know what Andy or whatever your customers are going to want? And the short answer is we're going to give them a lobotomy, and um, we're going to do that metaphorically and uh, it's it, it's quite interesting because whenever i talk to businesses about their marketing and that's from two-man startups up to you know global corporations i always ask the same question is well, you know what part of, of the human brain are we actually marketing this to and it's um people look at me like i'm a, a little bit crazy but then they always start to talk about the left side and right side of the brain which we all know is, is logic and creative and stuff and it's like, no, 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 what part of the human brain are we actually marketing to? Because the human brain is essentially made up of three parts. At the very base level is the brain stem. It's called the lizard brain because that's the only part of, of the brain that lizards actually have. So it looks after all our involuntary workings, all our basic needs to survive and function. It gets scared, angry, hungry, horny, all of those sort of things. And then it doesn't really do much else. It just deals with the very base level stuff. Beyond that is we have the mammal brain and then moving on to the human brain as well. Now the mammal brain or the limbic part of the brain, that starts to evolve what the lizard is already thinking. So it records memories of behavior and matches them to good or bad experiences. It starts to become responsible for emotions and controls our behavior. Now both the, the brain stem and the limbic brain are all working in our subconscious. And when I talk about these, these three things to the companies, they always start to say, well, obviously we, we, we market to the human brain because the other two are happening in the subconscious. And that's the first big mistake that they make. Because while the neocortex is, is obviously what makes us human and what makes us evolve beyond most other mammals, it's only us dolphins and some primates that actually have one, is what gives us compassion and reasoning, imagination, problem solving and so on. What it does is it oversees and rationalizes the reactions of the lizard and mammal brain. It's not the one that actually drives the main want or need for a product or service. And so when I say that people are marketing to the wrong brain, they generally are, because what we need to be doing is actually marketing to the lizard brain as a starting point. But we need to be marketing to all of them in a very set order. And we follow that decision path as we go through. So 50% of a decision that we make as a human being is actually done in the lizard part of the brain. That's where the want comes from. Moving on, the next 27% is done in the mammal part of the brain. So we're starting off thinking, I want, I have this strong want need in its very basic form. The mammal brain is then rationalizing that to a certain extent saying, okay, yes, I have good memories of, of that. that. That's good, Let, let's, let's roll with that. And only then does the human part of the brain step in and actually reason with itself and saying, yes, that's a good decision or a bad decision, and this is how we're going to approach it. So for those who already haven't done the maths, 77% of all the decisions that we make happen in the subconscious. And then if we're not targeting that 77%, then just by you know, the law of averages, we only have 23% chance of actually hitting the marketing target. 
So it's very important that we actually cover all of these bases. So I'm going to very quickly run through what each of those three brains sort of do in terms of marketing and how we can actually market them a bit better and just round it off with it with, with hopefully a fairly easy thing that, that you can do yourselves to actually see and, and we'll start to work things out when, you, when you're back in the office tomorrow. So first off, my chum, Larry the Lizard, he's going to help us work out what, what's core to that main brain stem. So what core needs does Larry have? It's about self-protection. His, his entire role in, in, in the brain is 100% selfish survival at all costs. And that governs all of his other needs, which is fear, greed, anger, reproduction, everything that we have on a very base level which helps him survive, even status in the tribe. And as humans, we, we like to say, oh, well, everyone likes to be liked and we think it's an ego thing, but it's, it's actually not. It's because like a lot of other mammals, and if you think about the, the great herds on, the, on, on the, the plains of Africa, all stick together in, in large numbers. It's because there's safety in those numbers and we still feel it too. So that's on a very basic level what Larry likes. So what makes him buy? There's two columns here. There's fears and frustrations, which is survival, to not be afraid, to avoid danger, avoid failure, to save money, avoid punishment. And then there's the other column, which is the dreams and desires to be secure, to be a winner, to be more attractive, to make more money, to be right, to feel important and yes, to get sex. So this is all the stuff that is governing Larry. That's all he's interested in. He's 100 percent selfish, does not care about anyone else. This is all about him lasting another day. So. I'm going to show you some examples of some advertising that has managed to, to appeal to the lizard brain. And there's two things here. One is that most marketing doesn't, especially in the modern politically correct world. So I had to dive down into the sort of politically incorrect world of the 1980s to find some good examples. Um, and I apologize in advance to everyone, but particularly the ladies um, who are on the call for this first example. That's the kind of marketing that worked back in the 1980s. And uh, there's a funny story about this because I was, I was doing genuine research trying to find these pictures yesterday afternoon when, uh, when my wife walked into the office. And it's taken some time for me to actually explain that this was for genuine research and work purposes. However, you can see in these days, this wouldn't work. We can't be this blatant anymore. And there's a very good reason for that. It offends a lot of people. However, some of the other examples hit the nail on the head just as well, but are slightly more correct. Michelin have done a really good job here. Remember that Larry is all about self-protection and also about reproduction and therefore protecting the young. So because so much is riding on your tires, that's all it has, has to say, just brief, sort of exudes safety and appeals directly to Larry. Here's another one. I, I put the words at the bottom in, in large on the side there, just in case you couldn't read them on the screen. It says, if you don't fulfill your potential, you will be replaced by someone else. So straight away, it's tapping into Larry's want to be part of the tribe, his fear of missing out. Maybe he'd be better off if he was accepting the strange cardboard man's proposal. And appeals directly to that part of the lizard brain. More modern advert here. Digital Day have done it quite well. The writing at the bottom underneath their logo says the big dog in e-business. And it's basically saying, do you want to be with the little guys or do you want to be with the great Dane of, of the e-business world where you're going to be safe, secure, and no one's going to try and get your data? There's another example here, another more contemporary one from Uber, which is slightly more subtle, but actually does talk directly to Larry. Your ride on demand, transportation in minutes with the Uber app. And what Uber have done here is realized that the big problem a lot of people have, especially in, in the big cities like London, where they're trying to flag down a black cab, is you're stood on the corner, it's raining, and you've seen four taxis go by with their lights on, and the one that did stop, someone else jumped into in front of you. And they know that's a big, big frustration. So what they've done is just say, it's yours, no one else can take it, and it's on demand as soon as you want it. No more waiting in the rain. And that appeals directly to Larry. So when we're marketing to Larry, there's 
a, a simple process that I generally go through. First off is we need to choose the best call lizard need to trigger. So that depends on who, who the persona is or who the target customer is that we're talking about. But if we go back to that list, it could be any of those uh, uh, any of those things that we covered earlier. Then we go into writing copy, and it's always writing copy before designing. That's a long-term thing in, in advertising agencies. They always like to do it the other way around. They like to draw the pity pictures and make the copy fit. Copy is what sells, so always do that first. But what we have to remember is that Larry is very selfish. And in the first session, for those of you who, who were part of that, remember we talked about the big statement, the big question all customers have is, what's in it for me? So always address what you can do for him before talking about yourself as a business. Never start talking about how big you are or how great you are. It's always first say, what we're going to do for you is X, Y, Z. We are going to solve this pain point. And then you can reinforce that, that you have the experience in order to be able to do it. Make your copy concise. Larry is, unfortunately for him, pretty dumb. So write your copies if you're talking to a 13 year old. Don't get too bogged down in jargon or long technical words because it makes people stop even for a fraction of a second and that loses the rhythm and the sentences that you're constructing. Once you've nailed that, then we can go on to designing the campaign. And remember, absolute clarity. Larry wants clear cut, obvious choices or he gets confused and then angry and nobody likes him when he's angry. Use good, relevant imagery. Larry deals mostly in images. It's how lizards see the world. And it's part of that process. If you imagine if you're, you're driving down the motorway and all of a sudden there's a big queue in front of you and you slam on the brakes, that's actually Larry kicking in before your human brain has begun to rationalize the situation. He sees everything in images and it reacts far quicker. The old adage of, of you know, a picture can say a thousand words is, is actually correct. So make sure we're using relevant imagery that tells the story in our mind before we've even started to read the copy. And that's it. That's a, that's a pretty simple process to be able to follow when we're marketing to Larry. My other friend is Eddie the elephant. Now Eddie is going to represent the mammal brain and we're just going to do the same sort of thing here. So what role does Eddie play in our decision making? Once you've grabbed Larry's attention, he is going to then let his good friend Eddie know that's the way our brains are wired. So Eddie then checks if there's any emotional memories logged to know how he should feel about Larry's request. So Eddie, first of all, is the seat of all value judgments that we make and they exert a big influence over the decisions that we think. So good versus bad, right versus wrong, worthwhile versus unworthy are all decisions that the mammal brain is deciding before we engage the human brain. And this is a really key point. Eddie has the ability to take Larry's need and turn it into a strong want. And if we can do that in marketing, it's one of the most powerful things that we can actually say in an ad. And it's one of the main reasons why the really good ads really work because they tap into Larry's needs, get him alerted, and we turn it into Eddie's uh, emotional pull to actually turn it into a want. And if Eddie wants something, it's very easy for us to internally persuade the human part of the brain that it's a good idea. And that's when we start to get impulse buys, we start to get people saying, I really, really must have this, I must have that pair of shoes or that new suit, or I must go to this restaurant. It's a strong want, and it, you begin to lose the rational part of the decision-making process. So we need to tap into that as much as we can. But what makes Eddie actually buy? So while Larry will feed off raw emotions such as desires and fears, Eddie is a little bit more evolved than that. And he learns to want things which aren't necessary for our human function, but it's part of, of what makes us us. So he wants to be informed. He wants to be curious, to have clean bodies and surroundings. He wants efficiency, convenience, dependability and quality to express beauty and style economy and profit because that makes his life much easier and much more comfortable he wants to save time perceive bargains make life and work easier he wants to be appreciated not just part of a herd but actually a, a, a respected part of that herd a well-liked one to be more comfortable to want to better himself and to be accepted within that social group so here is a pretty powerful advert from the WWF. 
that I think perfectly encapsulates how we, people can appeal to, to Eddie. So just the, the bloodstained smear coming out of the suitcase and don't buy exotic animal souvenirs. Remember, Eddie is very, very focused on that value judgment. So we see this and we're automatically repulsed by it. And that's what the WWF want. It's not about Larry the Lizard. There's nothing in there that is about our survival. So it has to appeal to on an emotional level, which they do brilliantly in this ad. Also, this is another nice one. It's from the American Disability Association, and it's just on a set of steps in, in the subway in New York. And it's for some, it's Mount Everest, help build more handicapped facilities. And again, it's a very powerful thing because it doesn't, and, and, unless you're disabled yourself, it doesn't affect you personally, but it makes you want to help. And it's a really powerful way of being able to do that. So, the last one here is from Apple, and this could actually have fitted into either Eddie's section or Larry's section, such as the, the genius of it and the simplicity of it. And this is obviously going back to, to the early 90s where people on the right did actually dress like that and it was considered cool. So I'm a PC, I'm a Mac, and that's all it had to say. And that appealed brilliantly to, to the aspirational part of Eddie, as well as stepping on a little bit from what Larry wants, but it's actually, yeah, I want to be the accepted person in that tribe. I want to be the cool kid. I want to be using the good machine. So how do we engage with Eddie? Well, the single most effective way is to build emotional engagement through empathy. And the way I do that is follow a very simple formula, which some of you may have already have heard of, is the problem agitate solve formula. So Start by addressing the before state for that persona, whether that's fear, anger, survival. That's the problem. Make the reader think, wow, that's like they've read my mind. That's exactly what's happening to me. And that's when we can get down into really hyper-targeted marketing. Because the more we can relate to people on that level, the more response we're going to elicit. So that means breaking your customers down into the smallest number of groups that we can sensibly handle and actually really drilling into their wants and needs. Then we agitate that problem. We poke the bear, so to speak. So we paint a picture of what life will continue to be like without the answer to their problem. And then we go into the solution. We move on to what the after state looks like for that persona, triumph, happiness, safety, whatever it might be. And once we tap into that, it makes it far harder, as I was saying earlier, for the human brain to over-rationalize and persuade itself out of buying something or taking a certain action. Now, the other part of engaging with Eddie is, 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 is you have to write copy that actually follows that problem agitate solve. So last night I was, I was thinking about this and I, I just decided to choose something fairly random, like a, a, a pretend new mattress. So this is the problem. This is how sort of I'd write a, maybe an opening gambit about my, my new sleep easy mattress. When was the last time you had a really good night's sleep? You know, the kind of sleep where you wake up genuinely refreshed and keen to jump out of bed to start the day. Then we're going to poke that bear somewhat. Bad night's sleep can leave you feeling like someone packed your brain with cotton wool. You can't concentrate, the kids are too much, and no amount of coffee can clear your fuzzy mind. But there's a solution. If this happens to you, then you need to know about our new Sleep Easy mattress. You won't just be sleeping, you'll be floating with perfect support all night long in a deep, peaceful sleep. Now, this is obviously slightly tongue in cheek, um, but it, it just illustrates how we can quite simply, through three very short paragraphs, just go through that problem agitate solve, and, and it, it paints the picture. It's what Eddie needs to hear. We are poking the bear in the agitate, presenting the problem. And this is why I wanted to go back to the before and after table, because this is really taking it on to the next step. So. This is one of the most powerful adverts I've seen for a while, um, as someone who, who used to be a smoker and still occasionally is. Um, this advert is actually following that same problem, agitate, solve uh, formula. So dad, I score today, I wish you'd seen it. That's, it's all automatically highlighting the problem. Then we're there saying one in two smokers will lose their life early due to smoking. So they're agitating it. Their solution is be there tomorrow.co.uk, which is a very nice URL because it actually wraps a solution into a, a call to action. So that's one of the most powerful ads I've seen representing it. And you can do it 
so simply. It doesn't have to just be through copy. It, 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 in that sense, it can be through this really powerful language. This was on billboards and press and, and everything else. So, at last, now we're 77% of the way through, the human brain begins to kick in. And between its two sections, the right and left side, this human part of our brain controls language and communication, creativity and thinking, reasoning and problem solving. It oversees the response to requests and raw feelings that come from Larry and Eddie, and ensures we remain sensible. The trouble is, it has to actually be consciously activated by Larry and Eddie. So that old saying about, you know, I was just so angry the red mist came down, that is actually a real thing. And that's Larry basically cutting off your human brain and saying, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm just going to be angry. And that's what's going to happen. Crazy in love, another sort of sentiment there that actually reflects that same thing. It's, it, we're not thinking sensibly anymore because Larry's wants are so strong that he's actually cut off the human decision-making part of the brain. So I just want to very quickly, everyone knows a bit about the, the left and right side of the brain, but I just want to touch on it very quickly. So the left neocortex is, deals with logic, analysis, linear sequencing, maths, language, facts. It thinks in words. It sings words of songs. It processes data. Whereas the right-hand side is about creativity and imagination, holistic thinking as opposed to linear sequencing thinks of arts rather than mathematics. It's non-verbal communication as opposed to language. It thinks in feeling and visualization. It hums the tunes of songs without ever really singing the words and it daydreams rather than processes data. Now as Marcus, most of us have a bit of both of these sides and we, we can sort of reflect and it's a constant battle every time we look at a campaign. Do we look at the data on the left hand side or start to get creative with our coloring pencils on the right hand side and the answer is these days unfortunately we have to do both there's no point relying just on data and producing the most boring copy and designs known to man and similarly there's no point being creative if it completely hits the mark that the data is telling us however most of your customers unless they're two marketers aren't going to be quite as is balanced left and right they're always going to have a slight bias one way or the other and so when we're marketing to the human brain here's my personal checklist that i generally go through rationalize first of all which side of the brain each of your personas uses more it doesn't have to be a big difference but whatever it is if it's the left side then we want to go more hard-hitting data we want to be using bullet points if it's the right side let's talk more through imagery even more than we need to to deal with larry as a, as a whole then we feed the human brain the rational meaning that we want it to conclude. What I mean by that is let's provide evidence through case studies and testimonials. Most people do that, it's a pretty accepted practice these days. But provide hard data and stats to turn your claims into statements of fact. So look at whatever your campaign is, your landing page, what, what claims are you making? Is, is it going to be that if you buy this widget, your life is suddenly going to become 20 times better? Well, if that's the case, and it might be true, you have to evidence that. You have to actually prove it, show before and after shots, show videos and testimonials of people transforming their life and suddenly becoming Superman. Demonstrate how the product solution will work. There's no point talking about this wonderful piece of software that you have. Let's actually show it. Put a two minute demo video on your homepage and see what happens. People will look at it because they're interested in the function. Once they've seen, does this tick my boxes? then it'll be, okay, yeah, now I want to see how it works. I want to see it in action before I move forward. This is all coming from the human part of the brain. Then we can start to use social proof to put their mind at ease and the authority principle. Now, uh, social proof and authority, there's, there's generally ex accepted that there's six different psychological principles of persuasion. And these are two of them which are, should be used most regularly in these situations. Social proof is the concept that we'd like to follow the herd. And so if lots of people are seeing good results from doing this, then the likelihood is that you will too. And the authority principle is basically people in that herd will follow and trust those who have perceived expertise and leadership. I just want to show you just because there's some examples here which, which will illustrate it far quicker than my words ever will do. Social proof. This is actually something that, that I grabbed off a website the other day. Join 23,647 marketers, smart marketers just like you. 
better results, great money. Yeah, I want to subscribe. I want my brainy ideas. That's social proof in action. You see, because you think, well, if 23 and a half thousand other marketers are reading it, then what am I missing out on? Basecamp. Um, Basecamp for people who don't know, it's kind of like a, a project management uh, online tool that's actually become really big the last sort of five or six years. Now, their uh, marketing is actually really quite fun and it's a perfect example. They use over and over again social proof and also authority. So last year alone, Basecamp helped over 285,000 companies finish more than 2 million projects. So you're thinking, well, okay, yeah, well, we're, if they've done it, I expect my project will work very well on it as well. Then the other advert has over 15 million people have used Basecamp at work already. Ask around, there's probably already somewhere at your company you've used it before. And all the logos of all the customers, all household names. Yep, it's, it's a good piece of social proof and authority. So next thing is, I want to quickly show, well, I'm going to pass back to Andrew for a second so he can quickly explain how Coolia do it on, on their side. Andrew. Good stuff. Thanks. Now, I'll hold my hands up and say I don't think I fed Larry enough in this particular example. Um, but <laughs> just walking through the different point, um, uh, proof points that affect the human brain. So you probably can't see it on this screen. But straight away, when we've done the introduction, it's a personal message from myself. And I've used my academic criteria to establish authority. So I've made sure that it's not just Andrew Nicholson founder and CMO of Coolia, but it's Andrew Nicholson, DIPM, Diploma Marketing, Masters, et cetera, et cetera, to kind of like hone in on the fact that this is someone who knows a fair bit about marketing. I then come in with some third party statistics about marketing automation and what it does for business. It increases transaction rates, it increases engagement rates, it increases conversion rates. Um, and then as you scroll down, you can see some customer testimonials because um, we love that social proof. And we've supported that social proof with some logos in there, some kind of um, logos of existing customers. I know Zinzan's on the call, so you can see the DMJ logo on there. So we're saying it's not just, you know, it's just not me saying this. We've got examples of customers have loved it, but fed back and given feed, uh, you know, given positive reviews of the product and the software. So I've taken a lot of your advice on board for this, Phil. Uh, and I've actually, <laughs> I've, you know, I've actually changed this based on the feedback that you've given me. But I'm actually just going to post that link there. And, in terms of a demo, anyone wants to see a demo, all they need to do is fill out the form and press submit, um, and we'll get that demo signed up for you. So there you go. I'm going to hand back to you now, Phil. How, how did we do in terms of the human brain? Have we, have we ticked all the boxes? Well, yeah, I think it is. I mean, it's, it's about evidencing what, what you're claiming, obviously, and having testimonials in, in sort of a B2B marketing software platform. Testimonials and case studies is the best way to do it. And then being able to actually offer free demos so people can have a look around. Yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. It's, it's, it's exactly what, what's needed on there. Maybe a video would be nice at some point, but I know you have them in other parts of the site. So it's, um, you know, it would be a bit overkill to have them on every page. Good stuff. Thanks, Phil. Okay, back to you. <laughs> All right. So I just want to introduce, and this is something that the uh, uh, so people can take away, like we had the before and after table after the first session. We have the brain table on this one. So we have the three columns, the lizard needs, mammal engagers, human reasons, our personas down the side or customer segments. And all we're going to do for each persona is fill in the lizard needs. So what raw need, want, desire are we focusing on? What's the mammal engager? So what, how are we going to engage them? What emotions are we going to be tapping into? And finally, the human reasons. So what can we say or show to persuade the audience that this should be acted upon? And I've started to fill this in for a couple of example personas are for people who might want to do a marketing training course. So persona one has his or, his or her lizard need is fear of messing up a campaign and basically getting fired. And the mammal engager is starting to rationalize that. If I get better, I feel good at my job and be valued. And yet if I mess up, I get embarrassed and fired, which is bad. So the human reason there is, okay, well, expert training means I'll learn how to get great results in my campaign so I look good and keep my job. So you can see how it starts to develop from a very core fear into starting to think about a solution to that problem and what it starts to feel like if it, getting better at marketing or carry on messing up the campaigns. Persona 2, he's much more blunt. He just wants to make more money. And the way he's going to do that, the man will start to think to himself, is yes, a pay rise. That's what I need. 
but I'm get a pay rise, I'm going to need to be worthwhile. Then the human brain kicks in. Well, if I learn to get great results, my boss loves me and I'm worth more money. Seeing again, start to see how that evolves. And I very quickly put together a little, uh, it's not designed at all, it's just a very simple text ad. Headline at the top for persona one. Remember, they're worried about messing up. So make sure you never mess up a campaign. All of us marketers have been there at some point, that moment when you realize your carefully crafted campaign is going to tank. Now you're going to get noticed for all the wrong reasons. So, but what if there is a way in which you could be sure you never messed up a campaign, that every one you launched was a big success? Phil's expert training course gives you all the tools to be certain your campaigns always generate ROI. So if you notice, we're also following that problem agitate solve formula through that as well, with a bit in italics being the agitate and then afterwards being, being the solution. Now there's an interesting thing happening on the call to action at the bottom as well. We are using social proof. So join the 2000 marketers who have already graduated. But underneath it, you'll see this new trendy thing, which is starting to appear in, in adverts around the place, is the negative CTA. Now the negative CTA, um, for people in the know, have been using it for a long, long time. But all the um, you know trendy Facebook advertisers have started to use it recently too. So join the 2000 marketers who have already graduated, or no thanks, I'll just hope I don't mess up. Now, of course, no one in their right mind is going to click negative CTA, which automatically makes the positive CTA more appealing. That's the whole point of it. And they are quite powerful and they do work. So Sorry, Phil, I'm just going to step in here. Jargon Buster, for those who don't know, CTA stands for call to action, normally a button. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I forget to, to explain these things at times. Apologies. Um, I've done the same thing for Persona 2. Now, remember, Persona 2 was very focused on money and getting a pay rise. So the headline we'd, we'd use for that, climb the ladder and get paid what you deserve. All of us marketers have been there at some point, that moment when you find out that you've been looked over for that promotion that should have had your name written all over it. That's the pay rise gone for another year. It's a well-known fact that the people most valuable to a company get the big bucks, and the marketers who hit home runs every campaign get the big bucks. Phil's expert training course teaches you how to smash the ROI on your campaigns, increase sales, and be the big gun in your team. Join 2,000 graduates who've already had a promotion. No thanks, I don't want more money. So again, you can see we're using exactly the same formula, largely exactly the same structure, just change a little bit of the, the theme of what we're saying and it fits persona two and it targets the three parts of the brain. So that's pretty much it uh, for today's session. A quick recap, um, marketing is all about understanding that before and after and building on that. It's appealing to the lizard's raw needs, wants, fears, frustrations, then engage the mammal with empathy through telling the story of moving from before to after. Persuade the human with facts, testimonials and reasons that are tuned into whether they are governed by the left or right side of the brain. Write it all down, fill in the tables, boom, you have the foundations of a strong proposition and strategy messaging for any campaign. And that's pretty much everything that we covered today. I know we're going to be sending out uh, the presentation for anyone who, who wants to get it. So I, th I think that's going to be happening in the morning. For anyone who does need more help, um, obviously Andrew is there with Coolia and we also do strategy workshops and discovery for your personas and help with emails and landing pages and so on. And that's it. So if there's any questions or, or anyone has, has anything that they want to ask, then uh, please go ahead. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna actually open it up to everybody. So here we go. Everybody is now unmuted. Uh, everyone hopefully will be muted any second now. Um, I just want to actually, Phil, I wanted to touch on, so the second persona type, it seemed to me that yeah. they were very much driven by money, but that's not, can't be a lizard need because unless I'm missing something, they didn't have money back in the times of the reptiles. So is, is that no, more a drive towards prestige and more, more towards food and f what's leading that urge? Well, well, um, because of the world we live in, money is, has become more and more of a lizard need because money makes it easier to survive. And that's all that Larry cares about is surviving in as much ease and comfort as possible. And, you know, you could uh, debate whether the sense of, of, of the world we've created for ourselves, but money basically is necessary in order to be able to do that. 
So yeah, money is a big driver in, in, in the lizard need these days. Good stuff. Any any questions from the audience? Hey Phil, it's Zinzan here from DMJ. Hi. Oh, yeah. Um, quick question on the lizard brain. Do you have any further recommendations on reading or any books on it? Because I think sometimes people can go highbrow every time, but I think the lizard brain is pretty powerful and I am kind of want to know more. Um, so, yeah, any recommendations reading-wise or past, past this presentation? Um, yeah, well, I, I, there are a few good books. Right? I can't remember the exact titles or where to buy them from at the moment, but what I'll do is I'll, uh, uh, I'll have a look back over my records and I'll drop them into an email to Andrew to, to forward on with the presentation. If you like. I, I can jump Absolutely. in here because I've got some crackers, if that's okay, Phil. Um, yeah. Yeah, go for check it. out Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And it's either by uh, Tversky or Kahneman. Both both of them are, you know, they, they worked together a lot in the past. I can't remember who wrote it. I think it's Tversky. So T-V-E-R-S-K-Y, Daniel Tversky or Amos Kahneman. Um, and the thinking fast is the lizard brain and the thinking slow is the more rational part of the brain. It's a little bit academic. It's a little bit weighty. Um, yeah. I suggest as well, if you have a look at Dan Arely, uh, which is A-R-I-E-L-Y, he's written some fantastic books. One of them is called Predictably Irrational. And the irrational part is the lizard brain, um, how we can use, focus on the lizard brain, how we respond to the lizard brain and how you know the human brain, which is rational and considered, actually most of the time gets overridden by the lizard brain. You will find Dan Arely um, is a very easy to read author, very fun, lots of really interesting case studies and examples. He also does some really good TED Talks. Um, so check out his TED Talks. So that those, those yeah, are nice. yes, uh, very good. Dan Arely, yeah. Predict to be irrational is a good book. Ah, it's Daniel Kahneman. Thank you, Terence. Good, good man. Yeah. <laughs> What did, what did I say? Did I not say Daniel? I said <laughs> Amos Tversky, Daniel Kahneman. Thank you very much, Terence. Uh, this cool. is and I'm another quick question, it. Phil, if you don't mind. Um, cool. What about? So I work for a legal and company secretary recruitment, so it's obviously a little bit dry. Um, yeah. And what about when I come up to a bit of objections when I say to you know, like my boss, or other people on the team, look, I know we're meant to be highbrow, we can use case studies, we can use that um, human brain, but really, like, you know, amongst all people, regardless of position, that lizard brain is so powerful. Do you have any tips there on explaining how important it is or any common objections you see to people not wanting to market to the lizard brain because they think it's too lowbrow? Um, the easiest way I always find um, is is one by actually explaining what it does and, and without the lizard brain everything that the human brain or, or human element of the brain starts to compute is kind of worthless so if we're not tying it into some raw need some raw pain point then then the campaign is never going to be as successful but whether they believe that or not the easiest way i always find is to say well okay if you have for example a landing page or an email or something digital it becomes quite easy to start split testing stuff and so if you can actually split test something quite easily, if you have that tech in, in house, then proving it is, is always the best way <laughs> because people will be skeptical because it sounds very like it's marketing theory and, and everything else. But in reality, just say, look, I can prove it. You give me one campaign split test and I, I will beat your results. And uh, I, I've had to do that to clients over the years and invariably I always win. But um, <laughs> you not be cocky as me. I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, thanks. I appreciate it. I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go on the next one because we launched one in January. So I'll go one one complex, a little bit more human brain, and one lizard, and see we go. Yeah, absolutely. Good I appreciate stuff. that. Good questions, Zinzan. Thank you very much. Okay, it's it's drawing. Hey, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Helen, sorry. Yeah, Helen, yeah, just a very quick I question. Am... I, um, I'm curious to know whether you adapt um, this principle when looking at services versus product selling, because I, I feel that some of the examples you gave were, were very tangible, um, you know, sort yes. of easy things to sell, like the mattress idea. When we're selling services like, you know, like what like we do, leadership training or employee engagement programs, a little harder to sort of show the, the definite benefits to, from our solutions rather than the, rather than the tangible product. Um, well, it, in a way, yes, it is. It, it, it is more difficult than tangible. And, and I, 
you know, I, I'm in the service industry myself as well. So it's, it, it, it is harder because you are ultimately selling your own time as an expert. And therefore it, it becomes a, this is kind of English embarrassment about selling your own expertise, I suppose. But what you have to do is actually think of yourself as a product. Um, and actually as a, a consultant or a, an agency or a services company, just think of your people as products. And, and actually it, it, it sounds like a very simple cop-out of, of an answer, but it becomes quite a powerful thing because I know, for example, when I'm uh, talking about my stuff, I, if I go into a meeting with a client or a potential client and I'm meeting maybe agencies that are much, much bigger and everything else, I, I know that I will know more than them. And I know that I have the answer that they don't have on, on a simple level because they, they haven't taken the time to actually research and study everything that I have. And I, I, I know that consultants in your business, Helen, as well, have, have a very similar level of expertise. Sure. It's, it's don't be shy about it is the main thing. Um, but what you do have to do is, is when it comes to reinforcing for the human side, uh, for the human brain, when it starts to rationalize that decision is you have to be even more um, sort of forthright with the evidence and you have to actually have personal references and video testimonials as well as just sort of product case studies or reviews on Amazon or anything like that that you might do for a, a, a 20 quid, you know, hairdryer or something. So it's, it is the same principle very much so and you have to start thinking of, of your people as products however cold that sounds and it's but you do have to reinforce it and it is really exactly the same thing because the the lizard needs are still the same i mean if you if your guys go and go into a company ultimately you're helping them have a better work environment be more productive and to make more yeah. money and yeah. so it's it's still tapping into that exact same principle it's just when it comes to reinforcing it, you just probably need to be a little bit more detailed than, than you would be for a, a more simple product. Sure. Fantastic. Really useful. Thank you very much, Phil. You're welcome. OK, any other questions from the audience or shall we wrap it up for the evening? I'll take that silence as wrap it up. OK, well, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, in particular, Phil, for a very interesting uh, session. Very Great stuff. Um, I've actually posted the link to the landing page um, that we discussed earlier. So if anybody would like a, a Coolio product demo, uh, please just uh, fill out um, the details, send it across, and we will get in contact. Um, I've promised no selling on this webinar, and that's banned, so that's as far as I'm going to go. But I would wish everyone a wonderful evening, a safe journey home, because it is icy out there, folks, so be careful. Um, and we'll hopefully see you again in the new year, where we will be looking more at digital psychology, and um, um, kind of the psychology of marketing, and we'll be looking at anchoring um, and what else we're we looking at, anchoring and persuasion devices. So we'll send out details of that closer to the time. Okay, thanks all, and have a good night. Thanks, Andrew. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.